All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome everyone. Hopefully everyone's lunch has had enough time to digest that uh, you can pay attention here. We'll be, uh, I'll try to keep it engaging and focused. Um, so this talk will go through um, kind of part one of a series that looks at some lower level stuff that we'll build on in parts two and three. Um, it was already asked, yes, the slides will be available. There'll be a link at the end. Uh, where you can download all the stuff. But first, a little bit about focus on Windows. Interesting. A little bit about me. I'm a possessor of many hats. I've done all kinds of stuff from system administration to DevOps, to software engineering, to architecture, to a lot of stuff. Currently at LL3 Energy, so if you're interested in energy microgrids or blockchain, that's what we do. Combine the two things together. Formerly, I was at Autodesk, and at Autodesk, I got to be part of a team that did um, SOC 2 compliance on a Docker-based service, which was a lot of fun and a really cool project, and that's really what inspired this series. So in that project, we used some commercial tools to be able to achieve the objectives of SOC 2 compliance in a Docker environment, which was great, but it got me thinking, what can you do with Docker itself or with some open source tools to get as close to that as possible. So I will say if some kind of compliance adaptation is your objective, this will be good information, but you'll definitely want to look at some of the commercial tools. They're going to solve a lot of the problems for you, particularly around um, <clears throat> continuous monitoring and analytics and reporting and all the things that you need to do to prove compliance. But if you're like most people and your boss comes to you and say, hey, we're running Docker, um, I want to make sure we're doing it securely, oh, by the way, your budget's zero, go. Um, <laughs> which I'm sure no one's heard before. <laughs> this is some of the tips and information that I've kind of gathered along the way of different ways you can do it with uh, things that are built into Docker um, or some open source tools. Uh, but first, I do want to address the whale in the room. I do know that not all containers are Docker containers, um, but Docker is definitely the most popular. It's one of the most momentum. Um, so most of this stuff um, that we'll talk in this talk are, well, a lot of it is lower level, like what empowers Docker, the container stuff. So it may work on other container runtimes. It may not. Um, so your mileage may vary. It is more focused to what you can do with Docker specifically. Um, so some of the things we'll look at and you'll get commands or we'll see examples of using Docker itself. So if you're doing run C, you're doing LXC, you're doing name your new uh, container runtime of the week, your mileage may vary on this. I also do want to note that it's orchestration platform agnostic. Um, there are a few of these. These are just ones that I've had some experience playing around with. Uh, most of them, most of you probably, if you're doing orchestration, are using the one there on the far left. Um, so when I'm looking at what these things can do, I'm not going to focus on those tools. This is kind of what Docker provides. Um, so if, you're, if you work in this environment, if you're working in Kubernetes, you may see some of these options that we're going to go over kind of exposed within Kubernetes. So hopefully you get a perspective of what's happening underneath Kubernetes working with the container engine and what it's doing and how it's actually enforcing some of these rules. So when you say you want a container to be a read-only file system, I'll show you exactly what it's doing behind the scenes for it to do that in a Docker environment. So this is part one. No experience is required. You do not have to have used Docker before to hopefully get something out of this talk. We'll go a little bit into what Docker is and how it works kind of level set uh, for the talk. Parts two and three will build on this knowledge. Um, so if you like, bring your friends to part two and they didn't attend this, I'm kind of expecting that they know a bit about how Docker works to really get the most out of it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Docker and just get an introduction, level set on what it is we're doing and uh, how these things work. So first, what exactly is a container? Well, a container is not something special. It's, it's not a magical 
platform that never existed before. They've been around for years. Um, so they have a root in like in change root and then Solera zone, well, then FreeBSD jails and then Solera zones and we've called it various other things through the years. They've been around for a long time. But really, when we're talking about containers on Linux, it's a combination of mainly three things. Linux namespaces, which allow to isolate process runtimes or processes within their own kind of environment so they can't access external resources they're not authorized to access. Control groups, resource management, and set comp profiles for managing what system calls are allowed or disallowed. So this is what Docker does. It packages up a runnable, distributable thing that complies with these three concepts that knows how to use namespaces, control groups, and, and set comp to be able to isolate a resource and, and pass it around. So what it looks like is a little bit like this. This is an oversimplified version of it. But basically, you package everything you need into a distributable component um, that we call an image or a container where everything's there, so you have some runtime dependencies, all your application code's there. You can even put what looks like a root file system in there, um, but it has no kernel. Well, if it looks like it ha has a kernel, it doesn't actually use it, right? It, the container is sharing the kernel of the underlying host, and that's why even on Windows, they're still Linux. Um, they have kind of a base file system. You package your runtime, your dependencies, your, and then your application on top of that. And then you can run it anywhere capable of running that kind of a thing. Um, so in Docker, anywhere you have Docker Engine, that's a compatible version. Um, you could run this and run exactly the same from your workstation to your production environment. Part of what's made them so appealing is it's done that so much easily, even more easily than Vagrant has. So they feel like a virtual machine. That's why they're kind of like pseudo virtualization because when you get into them, you're like, oh, this is kind of like a VM. So if you're first getting experience with them, that's what they are, but they're not actually fully virtualized, right? They're isolated processes that run in their, in a segmented part of the kernel or um, that's kind of firewall, not firewalled off, but given its own namespace to run. So it's kind of pseudo virtualization. Everything shares a kernel. So we have our host kernel there, and on top of that, there's some of the foundation um, components that the container relies on. Then you have some kind of container engine, which there are multiple out there. Again, this is kind of an overly simplified version of it, but it's the basics of what a container is. So the container engine is really providing a shim to interact with the underlying kernel and be able to translate calls coming in from the namespace to the kernel to actually be executed down the CPU. So, why is everyone so excited about Docker? Why is Docker such a big thing? So, if there have been other containers that have been around longer than Docker, why do we always associate these two things? Well, essentially Docker did one thing more, better than anyone else, and that made, it made them easy. They provided a runtime, they provided tooling to easily package and distribute a container. In short, they solved the distribution problem. All right, they created a toolkit that anyone can use that's cross-platform, where if I do Docker build, etc., I get an image, I copy that image somewhere else, they can run it, a couple of commands, I didn't have to learn anything underlying to make it work, it just works. So that's why when they were, uh, when Docker came about um, in 2013, if I recall correctly, even though containers had pre-existed for a couple of decades, they weren't really, you know, they weren't nearly in as, use, as much use as they are today. So, and that's another reason why this talks about Docker, is because the adoption rate of Docker versus other container technologies it's generally far and above what others are doing. Now, the rise of Kubernetes is starting to change that as it makes the underlying container runtime less important, but uh, that is uh, kind of the state of where things are now. So, and again, I know not every container is a Docker container, just not like, just like 
not every flying disc is a frisbee. So let's get into some fundamentals. So really, a lot of this is going to be lower level, what's happening within Docker Engine, or how you can leverage, um, you know, kind of the native Docker capabilities for managing. So it's a few things that I pulled together um, to help that can help lock down and harden the container or the runtime environment. But first, I want to classify containers. So when we talk about them, we talk about kind of more generically. Let's take a look at a couple of different types. And mainly, I want to think about two different types, a service container versus a tool container. I'm just throwing these names out there. So the service container is your web servers, you run a container, your database servers, you run a container, and I won't have the debate if you should run database servers in a container, but um, these are your application runtimes, the things that you launch and run perpetually until you choose to recycle them. Right? So it's hosting some kind of a service. Tool container is your CLI tools you're distributing as a container. They're your build, pack, your, your build pipeline tools uh, that you're distributing as a container. Your small like batch jobs you run as a container. These are the things that you, you spin up you run for a very short period of time and then they die and then you run them again when you need to. So most of what we're going to talk about is more oriented towards service containers. Um, this really accounts for all three parts um, because they're the ones that are more vulnerable to attack because they're up and they're usually exposed somewhere. You know, a tool container a lot of time doesn't live long enough to make it worth putting serious effort into hardening the runtime it runs on or hardening the container itself. And a lot of times you're not going to get the return on the investment in doing the, the, the hardening work. So um, that doesn't mean these, these tools or these uh, ideas won't work. Um, it's just something to consider as you're building these things out or as you're applying some of these or thinking about how, how you uh, need to secure any container you're building or running, Consider your security guidelines and the trade-offs time versus um, payoff for doing it. So as you're thinking about this, we're mostly talking about service containers, so have that in mind. All right, let's get into actual some meat of this now that I've gone through some introduction. Security starts at the top. So what does this mean? Well, let's take a look at a sample Docker file, and I'll tell you. So this is a very basic Docker file. You've probably, if you've done much Docker, you've probably written one that looks something like this. What we're doing here is we're pulling down Node, we're installing it, we're adding our app to it, um, and you know we now have our app Node runtime application container. But there's one particular line there at the top I want to focus on from Ubuntu 16.04. So what this does in Docker is it tells it, this is the container image that I want to base this image off. I'm going to inherit everything from this and build my new thing on top of some previously built container. So my first tip is know you're from. Know where you're coming from. So let's look at why this is important. So we looked at a Docker file, used Ubuntu 16.04. Here's a security scan of Ubuntu 16.04. This is out of Quay. Um, if you haven't used Quay.io as your registry, I would encourage you to take a look at it. It's fantastic. Uh, but this is one of the features they provide, is a security scanner built in. In part two, we'll actually look at the underlying open source scanner that they use in Quay. But this isn't too bad. So we got one high vulnerability, a few mediums, a few lows. So if you base your container off this, you're not getting too much. How many of you use Node? Great. How many of you ever do have done in your Docker file from Node latest? Anybody? Good, because that's Node. That is the current latest version of Node from Docker Hub. 83 high-level vulnerabilities, 212 medium, and then from there, it doesn't even matter, right? So this is the runtime dependencies you're inheriting that could expose vulnerabilities through your application, right? So if you're building on this 
and it's got a bad version of OpenSSL, which I don't see in the particular top list in my cut, um, and you're using SSL in your application, you're now exposing that out, right? So you really need to pay attention at where you're coming from because you, you're getting whatever garbage was in that container. And if you're basing your dependencies on stuff that's in that, um, you, you've exposed those out. So they are legitimate vulnerabilities you should pay attention to, just like you would on a virtual, on a, on a virtual machine or, or a physical machine you're working with. So how do we get around this? Well, in the immortal words of G.I. Joe, knowing's half the battle. Uh, the other half, well, let's take a look at some, some an idea. Creating a custom base container. There are certainly pros and cons to this approach. One of the major cons is there's an ownership question that can come up in larger organizations, right? Because someone builds the base, distributes it out, and says, okay, anyone building a node, here's your base node container, build your application off of this. Now there's a vulnerability discovered in that base container. Who has to fix it? And how many things do you need to rebuild? Right? So it has some trade-offs, but the advantage is you can really dial down exactly what it is in your runtime before you start building your application. Um, and it, it, so we'll look at some rules later that really help make this clear of, of the trade-off you get. So to me, this is a valuable trade-off. It's worth it. So some rules for building a quality custom base container. First, starting tiny is better. There's a ton of tiny Linux distributions. My personal go-to is Alpine. You can choose others. Um, this has a couple of advantages. One, they tend to have almost nothing in them by default. So you're inheriting almost nothing. Um, they, they generally scan clean right out the gate, which is great. Um, it also is uh, the added advantage of it's less container bits to push around. Because when you pull Ubuntu, you're getting this whole full-blown generic Ubuntu environment for who knows what you know, general purpose application that has a lot of stuff that you don't need. And now you're pushing those bits over the wire when you're trying to distribute it. So Tiny's good. One note about Tiny bases, if you're used to working with like CentOS, Ubuntu, or some of the bigger distributions, um, they do tend to work a little differently. So it may take some experimentation to really understand how they work. Um, even some of the commands you might be used to may not work exactly the same way as you've been used to. So take some time to explore. Uh, that'll pay off in the end. So patch is part of the build. So put in there whatever your package packing system, if you're uh, in your container, put that right into your base. So if you're doing Alpine, you know, APK update, you know, Ubuntu apt update upgrade, you know, yum update. So go ahead and build it right in. So that way you know anytime you rebuild your base, you're just going to automatically get whatever the latest and greatest distributed by that, that distribution is. So this can, just keep in mind when you do a rebuild like this, right, it's going to generate a new version of this image. That's a base layer image. So any application you've now built on this image is going to have to do essentially a full rebuild. So plan these within your build pipelines if you're doing this because everything you built off that is going to have to go through a, a longer build cycle than they would typically. So and build a, a shared base for your services. So if you, uh, if you have a lot of Ruby stuff, build one Ruby base. And any application that needs to build off that, use that. Sorry, so it lowers your overhead. No similar. Anytime, any of these runtime places, just build one um, and, and go from there. So install your common build tools, NPM, gem, et cetera, in, in the base or any you know, common uh, runtime tools you need. Uh, and what, as well as whatever base runtime. This is also really great to like level set across the company. We're going to use node version X for all of our applications. Um, you, know, it, you can just distribute that and then it's kind of the decisions made for, for the developers downstream. And leave those application specifics for later, right? So if they need a special gem, don't build it in here unless it truly is a common thing. 
you know, put, you know, have the developers put that in. They can do that in their Docker file as they inherit it. Uh, I've always been wondering, this kind of goes against the principles of those containers, right? Because they, the point of them was that you can have whatever you want and pack it and ship it, right? Yeah. So, so, you, so you have sort of, you got this wonderful container and now you're tying your hands, hands behind your back. Well, it's, there's a conflict of what is the true, like, you know, hippie, free love version of what a container is and what an organization needs to do to live. <laughs> right? Exactly <laughs> okay, right? So, so for, in the container world, yes. Yeah. So you could build this base container. You could tell all of your developers, hey, I've got this great Ruby base container I want everyone to use. And all of your developers could do from Ruby and pull it straight from Docker Hub and completely ignore you and there's nothing you can do to prevent that. All right, so so it's about your organization standards and what you can get away with enforcing. Yeah, sure. I was wondering about your opinion. <laughs> so uh, my opinion is organizations need to have standards in order to live. Um, they need to be able to set something reasonable that they can agree to so that anyone can jump in and help. So the problem is if you build your unique thing, now you're the only one who can run it. And guess what happens when you decide to go traveling? You're the one who gets the call because you're the only one who understands it. <laughs> So I would say if anyone pushes back against this, just be like, okay, you can build your one-off thing, but if it breaks, I'm going to call you. I don't care where in the world you are or what time in the world it is there, right? Um, I think Netflix has that. It's like a core corporate philosophy. It's like you can build, you can use any language, any tool set, anything you want, but you own anything you build. So you're kind of incentivized to do what the team around you, use what the team around you is using so that... If something goes wrong, you could actually be on vacation and other people can help, right? So also, and this is similar to a virtual machine, right? Install only what you need in these containers. Don't add extra packages or dependencies that you think you might need later. If you think even like 70% of my developers need this gem, but 30% do not, let those people put it in. They inherit from your base. They do gem install my thing, and then you know continue to build their application from there. And then leave build tools on build containers. So you know if you're doing um, a make or you're doing you know you're compiling some Ruby code, um, you know so do your do your, um, your your bundle from somewhere else, and then grab what it built and put it in your container runtime. So have a separate build container from your um, service container, your service base. So it may mean you actually end up creating two bases. One's designed for build pipeline kind of things and one's designed for actual like runtime implementation. But again, that kind of falls in that classification thing, right? The tool container has a little bit looser roles, rules because it's run life cycle. Its use case is different than what you're going to build your service on. So a little pro tip if you're new to a build, so like, okay, I heard Alpine's great. I'm going to try Alpine. I've never used Alpine before. I heard it's weird. Docker run, IT. Who knows what IT stands for? And, and TTY, right? So that's good. You can get an interactive shell on it, base image and tag, and then just bin SH, right? You can get a shell into that container. So you launch whatever it is your base, Alpine latest, Alpine 3.7, whatever. Start to play around with it. Figure out how the build commands work. Don't you know? Go don't go immediately. Try to shove it in a Docker file and then be frustrated with the fact that it doesn't build. Who knows what a scratch container is? Containers that don't inherit. They don't have a problem. Close. Yes. Essentially, that's it. So, Docker containers need a file system. But that file system doesn't need to be inherited from another container or be like some what looks like a full-blown distribution thing. So what you can do is if you're running something small or something that is statically linked, you can just build the image. Right? You can do uh, with only those things you need. You don't need to put a runtime in there. You don't need all of these dependencies that your runtime needs, you can do this. 
How it works is simply this, from scratch. It's a special from type in Docker that tells it, I'm gonna build an empty file system and whatever they put in it, that's the only thing that's gonna be there. So this works really great with statically linked stuff like Go, right? So if you build a Go application, if statically compiles, you can take that compiled application, run it wherever it's supported, right? For that runtime. You can build your application, your Go application, do from scratch, just drop your built Go binary in there, add any dependent like configuration files, etc., and that's it. This is really great for two reasons. One, the only thing in the file system is your Go binary and whatever like config, fa config files. So there's almost nothing to push around on the wire. It's super tiny. So distribution is super fast. It also means you've got nothing to compromise on other than your own application. So assuming the security of your application's good, the Go thing you've built, there's nothing extra, no risk you're inheriting from some runtime. So if you're doing things in Go, this is a great way to do it. Uh, one trade-off in that is, and when we look at vulnerability scanning in part two, you can't really scan this container because it's got nothing to look for. So it's probably either gonna whitelist it and just be like, good, um, which can give you a false positive of, yes, there's no problems. Well, there's no problems it could detect. Um, or um, at worst, you know, it could fail catastrophically and give you an error. <laughs> Depending on this, this scanning system you use, just be aware if you're putting stuff in your, um, your build pipeline where you want to do a container vulnerability scan and then fail build on results, if you're doing these, just you pay attention to, to how these work. You know, that's some, a, a scenario you'd want to test in your environment. But they're great for that kind of a, a small thing. Capabilities. So this again, this is a Linux kernel feature that um, containers have access to. This is uh, the ability to, uh, Docker provides a way to holistically add or remove like whole capabilities from containers to get rid of whole segments of potential problems. Super easy to use. So let's take a look at what they remove. So there's an option in the docker run um, command minus minus cap drop and you can remove a capability from that that container execution so let's take a look at an example here we're running an ubuntu container and we're dropping cap set uid and cap chone <clears throat> so it's not the full so if you're familiar with Linux capabilities it's not the full name there's like a sys underscore something there right so it kind of truncates that and just focuses on the most immediate part it needs so what this does is within the container, uh, you know, so within its namespace, if you try to do set UID, the process in there tries to change users. So, you know, if someone breaks your Redis server and tries to do a privilege escalation, um, it will fail. I'll give you a permission tonight, right? We holistically remove that capability. It's same with Chome, right? So if someone tries to, you know, say your container um, takes file uploads, right? and it's writing there. So someone uploads a malicious file, tries to set an execute bit on that file, tries to get your thing. And let's say your application is vulnerable to let it run things. So they try to run to add execute, can't change, or can't change it, right? Actually, that's a bad example, but so they can't change, you know, they can't change it to run as root, right? So uh, that's a really, uh, these um, capabilities are pretty powerful. There's a few of them that are in there. Um, and Docker makes it super easy. So you may see this show up in your orchestration solutions as just a, like a box, right? Here's the capabilities you want to remove or add. This is what it's doing when it calls Docker, run, when it does a Docker run execution, it gives these cap drops and adds for whatever you provide. You can also add capabilities. Um, is cap add. So where is adding capabilities useful? There's a couple of scenarios is useful. One, if you're feeling particularly paranoid, you could drop all capabilities and then add the only the ones they need. So if really high security in the environment is important, that might be some uh, an approach you need. It'll take some debugging to get it right, but 
Um, that's certainly something you could do. Is drop everything, then add the particular ones you need. Sorry, do you need to drop everything explicitly, or is doing this implying that you're drop, dropping everything? You need to drop everything explicitly. So, and I'll show you a little bit um, what the defaults are. Another re place this is useful is if you need a container to run with an additional privilege or some additional privileges because it does something special. It's a sidecar for some other container where it needs to be able to do something with the container it's connected to, right? Might be an example. So this is a way that you can get to having a more privileged container without having to run as fully privileged. And we'll talk about privileged later. Um, but this is a great workaround. Docker by default whitelists a set of capabilities, so or a subset. And these are all of them. So you can kind of see in the defaults, I'll put the link up there for the curious. These are all the ones it puts there by default. It's a generally good subset of capabilities that it allows. Um, but depending on your service, it may be more things than you actually need. Like so, one example, like say your container doesn't actually open any ports, right? It runs something and doesn't need to connect to anything. You could drop cap net bind, right? So then you don't, then it can't open ports. So if that container were compromised for some reason, someone tried to open a port out to reach out to some botnet or to download some malware, they can't open a port because you've removed that capability from the container. So something to pay attention to, uh, capabilities in there. Secure comp computing mode, set comp. So this is something that Google originally created and then it's got been baked in the kernel a while ago. And Docker again uses this um, and allows it. So what these are is an allowable list of system calls that a container can do. So out of the more than 300 syscalls available in Linux, Docker whitelists 44 by default. So that's a pretty good start, but again, just like the capabilities, um, they may be, they're kind of general purpose set okay, of, of syscalls that are allowed. So they may be more than you really required. So it's opening up something that you, a door you could close. So the way this works is you provide a JSON file of set, uh, set for a set comp profile. So here's a very small snippet of the default one. Um, if you go look at this later, it's pretty sizable because um, it's like every syscall you can imagine what they whitelisted and not lasted. That's it. They set the default to deny with an error. Um, so you'll get a permission to I try to do something that's not part of this list. And then here's just an example of a couple of them. Change or change mod, right? Uh, that, that they allow by default. And you can, you can tailor this to your needs if you want to. The advantage of the, the way they've done this is it's kind of all packaged in a JSON file. <coughs> so it's, it's fairly easy to get into container. You don't need to like... My capabilities where I was showing the example where you just kind of like one for each, you know, an option for each one you want to do, which, you know, if you're doing a lot of them, grows your command pretty significantly. Um, you can do all of these at once and just give it with one, one thing. It looks like this. Docker runs security op, and there's a space there, uh, set comp, and then the path to profile. So what's great about these is you can define a profile for a container service that you're running. So say you have a Mongo container you're running. Um, and you say, well, I want my Mongo container to only run these things. I'll create a, a Mongo profile uh, dot JSON that says here's what Mongo should be able to do. And you can distribute that. The disadvantage is, is now when you want to run a container somewhere, you now need two things. Container image and this file. Um, so ways to get around that, right? You can put these all in kind of like some shared storage in the environment. Just make these, you know, your set of profiles available everywhere at a known location. So when a container runs, it can just zoom anywhere where it's compatible to run. It just 
grabs that, and if that location's there, properly mounted, it'll grab the right profile and run. That would also be a safety measure if it's tried to run in a place where it wasn't supposed to run, that didn't have this file. This obviously would fail because it can't find that file. Um, so pros and cons, yet another thing, but it's super powerful. Um, you can really make a container be able to do nothing <laughs> if you wanted to. Um, let's also talk about immutable containers. So when Docker spins up, it creates a thin layer top file system that is writable by default, but they make it really easy to make it read only. So this is really great and you have some form of an attack where someone attacks your service, gets it to run something, have it pull down malware and then execute, right? So if the container file system is read only and they try to write that malware somewhere, it can't write they're stopped right there. Even though they've compromised your service, they can't do what they wanted to do and they can't get it to run your thing. So it's provided with a simple option and it's got some pros and cons like all of these things. So let's take a look at what that looks like. A Docker run, minus minus read only. That's all you have to do to make a container read only. By default, anything you try to write will fail. It'll tell you, it'll give you an error and it says read only file system. But that is the entire container. So that means temp is also not writable. Some ways around that. Docker also provides a temp FS option that you can specify where you want it to put temp stuff. Uh, so in this case, I've overwritten in the container slash temp with read write options, no X, no exec, no suit. Um, so pretty common defaults for, for a temp location, right? So that it allows the ho that host to provide a temporary location that's writable in the container. So you can override that behavior. If you need a writable temp, which isn't that unusual, um, I know because I've broken a container doing this in, in a production environment. Um, yeah, that's where you do it. The other note about read-only is that it does not, by default, apply to mounted volumes. So if your container does have some persistent storage that requirements, you know, it hosts a database or it hosts file uploads or whatever, you've mounted that somewhere because you shouldn't do persistent storage inside a container anyway, um, that by default will be writable. So you can use read-only, mount your, vo your persistent volume, and it will continue to work as it is for that location. Anywhere else in the container you can't overwrite but that one location you've mounted that's where your persistent storage is does continue to work. Control groups. Okay, so what are control groups? So they're a feature in the Linux kernel essentially to manage budget, resource allocation budgets. Um, so CPU, memory, disk I.O., et cetera, et cetera. It's one of the key things that a container is built on to be able to share resources. While it's not strictly a security setting, um, they are important to, to manage and pay attention to. Um, it is an option. It can be a security setting in the perspective of like preventing denial service attack, right? Someone gets in your container, tries to get it to fill up all the memory on the host or swamp the disk with I.O., right? You can, you can use this to, to block that. By default, it just does whatever the, the regular thing is. So Docker does a lot of this work for you. When you spin up a container, it puts it in its default control group, um, which yeah, I'm trying to remember the path it is, um, that it's kind of managing the resources for that namespace. Uh, there's a couple of things that you can do. You can overwrite the parent C group with an option, minus minus C group parent, and change it to something else you've defined somewhere else, if you have that need. You can also directly manipulate the limits. So, and there, these are some example switches. There's a variety of them. I would encourage you, the Docker run reference is fantastic. It is a great reference for all the things you can do with a Docker container, good or bad. Um, but it lists all of these um, CPU limits, block IO limits, memory limits, etc. that you can then set and define your container. Again, if you're using an orchestration solution, there's probably somewhere where they've said, how many CPUs do you want to allow? How much memory can this container have? 
this is what they're doing, is they're just providing this control group option to the container. Some other miscellaneous tips. Don't run as root. Yes, it's isolated process. Yes, root inside of a container is not root on the host. But still, don't open up a vector for attack against the container itself. If someone takes over your container and is using it to host something you don't want them to host, it's still compromised even if they didn't attack, it didn't get to the host, right? They still got resources. So don't make that any easier to happen. Create the, if you're running a service, create the user in your Docker file, have the uh, Docker has a, a command in the Docker file called user, which changes what the user context is within the container, and then go from there. Now, you do have to pay attention to if you're mounting persistent storage, especially, the UIDs can get mismatched. So it's a little, it takes a little trial and error to, to get it right. But I encourage you, don't try it. Um, so in other words, don't let your container become one else, someone else's crypto miner. Avoid privileged. Privileged breaks namespaces, and it gives it access to more things on the host than it should. So there's... Just don't. Avoid it at all costs. Uh, the only pseudo-legitimate case I've seen for privileged is an environment where you have like a security tool that's, you know, so you've got an agent installed on the host. It's monitoring all of the containers, the behavior of other, the other containers and auditing it in real time. Those will often run as privileged because they have to get to what all the other containers are doing. But even then, they could... By, by focusing specifically on the capabilities they needed to add, they could avoid having to go full privileged, right? There may be things that they don't really need. Um, so avoid this. Same rule applies to net equals host. That's also a special version of privileged, um, which gives it more you know, capabilities with the network interfaces than the container should have. So just avoid them. You can try to make your case, but I don't think you can come up with one where I think your container would be special. And the last thing, this is kind of a general rule. Be intentional about the security of your container environments. You have a question? Can I ask you a question about those network nodes? Sure. I'll try to answer. Well, just we had a scenario where we're running Jenkins in a container, then running the application using Docker Compose stands up multiple and ends with the networking between those containers. Uh -huh. So how would you handle, say I'll come up with bridge mode by default. Yep. So how would you handle connectivity from inside the Jenkins container to the networks that the composed containers have created? Um, this is to run tests? Yep. Well, on a build system, on Jenkins build pipeline. Um, they run a service endpoint that you would run your tests against? Well, all, all the... Right, so it's like a web server and you want to run unit tests right against a web server? Web service standard. So all the sibling containers can talk to each other, right? They're all sort of yep. composed. Jenkins can't talk <coughs> to those containers because it's a separate network, right? I'd use a, I'd expose the ports you need, that Jenkins needs to get to. Then you're going to have to... You can override that, right? Okay. So you could have a Jenkins a build doc compose file, which adds this additional capability and it's different. But it's just simple, minus P, host port, right? right. So if it's, you know, 80, you know, if it's 80 inside the container, right? Or if you're doing like 80, 80, right? This is a common one, right? This is host. This is container internal. So just add that to your Docker run command. And expose the port. Okay. We can check it offline. Yeah. Uh, you know, if it's in a build environment, eh, okay, right? Again, that kind of falls under the tool category. This is short lived, it's not out there perpetually. Right. So, like I said earlier, you can kind of fudge some of these principles in an environment where it's less l subject to attack, or if it is a compromise, it's not going to live long enough to matter. Um, but you, could, you can get around it if you want to. Thank you. So, uh, you know, like, and this applies anywhere generally in, within security. Just be intentional. Know what it is you're trying to accomplish. 
and the trade-offs for what you're doing and the options available to you. So some of the things that I showed you may be more extreme than you're wanting to go or may not be that useful in your environment or what have you. Um, but understand, yeah, you know a little bit more about how they work, understand how to apply those principles and, and kind of relate them to what you're doing. <clears throat> so I hope you've got something out of this. Um, even if you're, everything's on Kubernetes and you don't get to that lower level, you now at least should know kind of what it's doing with some of the options you have available to you within those environments. Um, GitHub.com, fork four, Linux Fest 2018. A lot of, um, all the slides will be there for all three of the talks as well as some supporting resources. Feel free to fork and follow as you see fit on this. Um, the presentation is uh, Creative Commons, just by the way, so if you're wanting to take this and, and do this in your own office and be your container security expert, feel free. <laughs> yes? Uh, do you have any like differences that you would change if it's off-the-shelf software and you aren't you aren't dev, so you're consuming a public container, obviously looking at drop-in capabilities. Mm -hmm. But if you want to like package WordPress if you have to or something, is there anything that you change that, that's additional to this? So if you're pulling something off the shelf, like a, a and I put WordPress in the big runtime category, right? Because that's really kind of what it is. Um, but if you're pulling something off the shelf where you don't have a lot of control over the base, um, you can try to lock it down as much as possible, right? Prevent it from doing other things. Um, you know, like the read-only switch might be a good thing. Like, hey, I can't control what vulnerabilities it have, but maybe I can mitigate the risk of them by making them less or harder to exploit or exploit damage be less. Um, I would also look... A lot of the bigger outfits or the more popular runtimes have started adopting the tiny is better philosophy. So if you went to, I, know, I gave the full node example and it looks really bad, right? Um, but there, what I didn't show you is there is a node runtime that they provide that's based on Alpine. That's better. Um, so look for those. And a lot of times they'll be tagged like, they'll be like, you know, node whatever version, and then node hyphen alpine whatever version, right? And they're, so they're starting to kind of catch up this, but they, they'll still build these like huge bases that have kind of the more established names, and then build tinier bases you just need to look for. Okay. How about um, sharing like database creds and crap to these, to those kind of things? Do you not just passing them as in the cards or? Um, environment variables have a problem that they can be sniffable. Right. Um, secrets injection is um, a trickier part. So some runtimes will give you a seek, an encrypted secret injection capability. Like I know Docker Swarm does, and it will mount secrets slash var or slash run slash secrets by default, I think. Um, so you put your encrypted secrets in the orchestration engine, and it injects them in an encrypted and secure way you know, so long as you trust that they've done that right. Um, you could also do something like HashiCorp Vault. We've used that before as a way to be able to manage where the secrets live that we feed into containers. Yeah. Um, you know, I look to the orchestration solution is the best way to, to do it. How's the logging or errors when you say drop all the capabilities and you try and run it? Does it say... Oh, I'm missing this capability, so I exited. Yeah, you'll get a permission deny error. Okay, but They'll it tells tell you, you which capability you now need well, to Well, you'll save. have to kind of infer that based on what you tried to do. It won't okay, tell you, okay. I, I can't do this. It just says permission denied. Okay. So. You still have to kind of dig into it. Yeah, okay. you have to dig into it a little bit. And that's where, you know, playing around in a not real environment might help you dial in, right. like, what it is, right. you know, locally before you, you push it out there into dev. Anything else? Good question. So, if the temporary FS you were able to lock down the the attributes, can yeah. you do that with volumes? I tried looking real quick on the documents. Off the top of my head, I don't know that you can. I think you might be able to say they're read-only mounted volumes, but I don't know if you can specify any of the other mount options. 
I would think you could, but I honestly have, I haven't done that before. Anything else? All right, thank you. So part two, we'll get into some.